This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. There were seven phrases that Jesus uttered on the cross, and I want to get right into them, okay? Now, I'm not going to read all of these scriptures that, that are first. Uh, just as we go through them, we'll read them. So I, I, I want to take a look at these. Uh, the first one is in Luke 23. Uh, verses 33 through 35. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know, they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he's the Christ of God, his chosen one. Now, the first two statements of Jesus are recorded in the Gospel of, are not recorded in the Gospel of John. We don't know why. Perhaps John didn't hear them, uh, although he was there because he records the gambling uh, by the Roman soldiers of Jesus' garments. We could speculate on why John didn't mention those first two statements, but in reality, we just don't know. But Luke did. Luke did mention these, which kind of goes along with, with the focus of the Gospel of Luke, which is the character and humanity of the Messiah. So Luke really looked at the character and the humanity of Jesus, and that's that's the perspective that he wrote his gospel. Uh, so we're looking at this first statement then, that's in Luke. This first statement is the words of forgiveness. The words of forgiveness. The phrase that Jesus, the first phrase that he uttered on the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher from, from England uh, many, many, many years ago, says that if we had no other description of Jesus, this text alone should convince us uh, of his deity, that this text alone would, would reveal who Jesus is. Uh, moreover, it should evoke adoration and worship within us for a Savior who asks the Father to forgive sinners. So Jesus, knowing that the whole reason for him hanging on the cross was to offer forgiveness for a world of sin, acknowledges that and confirms that forgiveness is available to those who will receive it. But to understand how forgiveness works, let's look at some key things about this statement by Jesus. First of all, there are some preconditions that we need to notice in all of this. First, uh, and this is in the context of Jesus offering up forgiveness. First of all, Jesus is not thinking about himself, but about the needs of others. The very reason that he's on the cross. I mean, the whole reason he was on the cross was because he was noticing he was there for the needs of others. Man needed a Savior. And that's why Jesus was there. He knew that. He understood that. His whole reason for being there was to meet people's needs. So Jesus wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about the needs of others. It kind of went along with what Jesus said back in Mark when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12, 31. Jesus was loving people. At the, even on the cross, He was loving people, focused on meeting their needs. The second precondition is that Jesus' concern was not based on how deserving or undeserving His enemies were. There wasn't, it wasn't about, oh, you, you deserve forgiveness or my love, and you don't. You deserve it, you don't. Had nothing to do with it. The third precondition is, I want you to notice that the prayer of forgiveness was in the midst of the offense. He didn't wait until things had settled. The forgiveness was offered in the middle of, right in the midst of the offense. And then the fourth precondition was that Jesus offered forgiveness before it was even requested. Now, how could Jesus offer forgiveness at a time like that? Well, in the discovery of this principle, we can discover how to forgive others in our own life. So let's talk about how do you forgive? If Jesus says forgive in the middle of all that he was going through, hanging on the cross, the most painful, brutal form of death that there ever was, in the middle of all of that, he could forgive people. How can we learn to forgive people in the crisis and issues that we go through in our own life? Well, first of all, I want you to notice that based on what Jesus said and the way he, was, the way he said it was, forgiveness requires a relationship with the Father. He said, Father, forgive them. There was a relationship. I'll be honest with you. I don't think you can truly forgive somebody unless you have a relationship with God. Now, you can argue with that, and there are people who are not Christians who can say, oh yeah, I forgive them. What does that mean? Forgiveness means that I release you of the debt. 
That's literally what the, what the word was, how the word was used. It was a term meaning you are released from the debt. And so uh, it, when Jesus said, I'm, forgive them, what he was saying, release them of the debt of what they're doing to me. When you forgive somebody, you're releasing them of the debt of what they have done to you. What they have done to you. Now, there are certain, we're talking about personal issues here. There are certain issues that are legal issues that we have no control over. But when we're talking about personal issues where somebody has offended you or hurt you or, or, or done something that has really messed up your life, how do you forgive them? Well, it begins, I think, with a right relationship with a father. Secondly, forgiveness requires an understanding of the offender's condition. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus saw their ignorance as a grounds for his petition. Wow, catch that. Jesus saw their ignorance as a grounds for his petition. If they had known who he really was, they would have not acted in ignorance. If they had believed that he really was the Messiah, they wouldn't have hung him on the cross. They believed that he was an insurrectionist, that he was a rebel, that he was a troublemaker. They believed that he was in violation of what they believed. And so they were acting out of ignorance, really, even though it was brutal, even though it was mean, even though it was... It was, well, it took his life. But the whole point was that they were acting out of ignorance. The rulers did not understand God's word, and so they had not taught the people God's word accurately. Get this. The ruler had not understood God's word. The ruler had not understood God's word, and so they had not taught the people God's word accurately. The Bible says that the people were in darkness. In fact, in Isaiah 9, 2, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. God said it. There was the prophecy from the very beginning that the world, people in the world, would be in darkness. People didn't understand. They were acting out of ignorance. The people walked in darkness. They thought they were doing God a service by killing Jesus. In fact, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They were blinded. They, they didn't see that they were doing something wrong. Or if they did feel like what they were doing was, was kind of mean-spirited, they still felt they were right. They were doing what they did was okay or right. When someone brings an offense against you, listen to this, when someone brings an offense against you, intentional or not, and certainly in Jesus' case, it was intentional, forgiveness requires an understanding that that person, without seeing, knowing, understanding, or even possibly caring about the full scope of the offense, deserves, no, no, that's not the word I'm looking for, is the one that you need to focus on offering forgiveness to based on their ignorance. See, if they knew that they were hurting you, why did they do it anyway? Was it intentional? Why was it intentional? What was the purpose behind it? Based on some other information that they had, that they had wrong? Is it, was it because they didn't really know you or they didn't really understand the circumstances? They didn't really know how brutal what they were doing was. What was the ignorance in their life? You see, forgiveness requires an understanding that the person, without seeing, knowing, understanding, or possibly even caring about the full scope of the offense, was the one who caused the offense. So they were ignorant. They acted out of some sort of ignorance. That doesn't relieve them of their responsibility, by the way. It absolutely does not relieve them from their responsibility, nor does it lessen the consequences. But it does remind us that sin, whether it is against God and or against you, is committed by one who doesn't really comprehend and or care about what they did. Get that. The sin that was committed against you was committed by somebody who doesn't either comprehend and or care about what they did to you. So forgiveness requires an understanding of the offender's condition. Secondly, 
Forgiveness, listen to this, forgiveness is never deserving. Did you catch that? Forgiveness is never deserving. Forgiveness is never deserved. Forgiveness is never deserved. This is really important to understand. You didn't deserve forgiveness from God. Your sin offended a holy and righteous God. Your sin doesn't deserve forgiveness. Your forgiveness by God came by an act of mercy and grace motivated by God's love for you. You didn't deserve it, but God provided it, offered it out of mercy and grace motivated by His love for you. Likewise, your offering of forgiveness to someone who has offended you is offered to someone who does not deserve to be forgiven. They have hurt and offended you and don't deserve forgiveness. The only way that you are able to offer them forgiveness, the only way that you can offer them forgiveness is as an act of mercy and grace motivated by, get this, your love for God. If God loved me so much that He was willing to forgive my sin, then because of my love for Him, I can offer His grace and mercy to the one that has hurt me because God loves him or her. This is really important. We feel like we have to change our attitude, like, oh, I have to, fall, you know, I have to kind of love this guy and so I have to forgive him. That's not what the Bible says. It's not what it teaches. You love them and grant them grace and mercy because God loves them. Now, this is, I, I, don't, don't stop there. We're just getting into this issue of forgiveness. It may have been the very words that pierced the heart of one of the thieves that was crucified on either side of Jesus that caused him to respond to that. Now, forgiveness, and you hear me using this term a lot, forgiveness is offered. Forgiveness, listen, forgiveness is not forgiveness until it is received. When Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, He didn't forgive them outright and just say, okay, that's it, all your, all your sins are forgiven. You don't have to worry about it. It's okay. That's not what He was saying. He was offering forgiveness. Forgiveness is a cycle. In the same way that God forgives you, He offers you forgiveness. It isn't forgiveness until you receive the forgiveness into your life. It doesn't apply in your life until you receive the forgiveness. For someone to say, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross and He died for all of our sins, so I'm okay. No, 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 no. He offered forgiveness. He died on the cross and offered forgiveness in doing so. It doesn't do you a bit of good until you receive that forgiveness into your life. In the same way with the people that you deal with, there's somebody that's offended you. You can offer them forgiveness as an act of mercy and grace because of your love for God. But it doesn't become forgiveness until that person receives it. So there was something that happened in the life of that thief that was hanging, one of the thieves that was hanging on one of the sides, uh, one of the crosses next to Jesus. And Matthew tells us that when, they, that when they crucified the two thieves on either side of Jesus, they actually began taunting Jesus. The two thieves on either side. Now all the people were taunting Jesus, including the two thieves. Matthew 27, 41 through 44. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires for him. For he said, I am the son of God. And get this, verse 44 says, and the robbers who were crucified with him <coughs> also reviled him in the same way. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the